Hi folks, good to be with you. <clears throat> it's lovely to be with you. Forgive me if I cough a little bit. I have a bit of a flu, so it's good to be with you. My website's jasonbirdspreacher.com and uh, you can look at Twitter, you can look at Facebook. You can also see the website, the Royal Blood Ministries website. Um, you, can, you can link up to that as well. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. It's good to be with you. Uh, I've been away for a while, uh, for a week in Holland, uh, doing mission in Belgium and in Holland, in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. So that's why there's been no videos. So some videos coming up uh, today. So I hope they're a blessing to you. <coughs> Excuse me. It's good to be with you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. We acknowledge your oh God, our need of you. We acknowledge our God that we need you today. Oh Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you might be pleased to bless us now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless us all. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these three are one. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to recommend some books. <clears throat> I've recommended this before. I want to recommend it again. It's John Piper. Uh, Let the Nations Be Glad, The Supremacy of God in Missions. It's an excellent book and it's published by IVP. It's a really inspiring book about mission. It, it's incredibly encouraging to read that book. John Piper, Let the Nations Be Glad, IVP. If you're a Christian, I'd encourage you to get hold of it. You can get it for free on Desiring God Ministries. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can get it for free on Desiring God Ministries. It will really bless you. Then the Messiah, Jesus, the evidence of history. The Messiah, Jesus, the evidence of history by Paul Barnett, IVP. IVP, the Messiah, Jesus, the evidence of history, Paul Barnett. Really, really helpful book on the historical Jesus. Is, is, is Jesus historically true? And it's an excellent work and I'd encourage you to buy that book. This is a classic, <clears throat> Josh McDowell, More Evidence Demands a Verdict. Josh McDowell, More Evidence Demands a Verdict. This is a really good book for students. It gives you lots of historical evidences for the Christian faith. It's really, really helpful. More Evidence Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. Uh, it's published by various publishers today, but it's an excellent book. <coughs> Excuse me. And then this book, Nothing But the Truth by Brian Edwards, Evangelical Press. Nothing But the Truth by Brian Edwards, by Evangelical Press. It, it's an excellent book in showing you why the Bible's inspired, how it's been preserved, uh, looking at supposed contradictions in the Bible, etc. It's a really, really good book, looking at the defense of the Bible. And it's by Brian H. Edwards, by Evangelical Press, and it's an excellent book. I would encourage you to, to get a hold of that book. Really, really excellent book. Sorry for the coughing, folks. Okay, we're looking at the woman at the well. If you turn to John chapter 4. <coughs> Excuse me. John chapter 4. And we'll read. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, <clears throat> and he must go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. 
Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There come up a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and do it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. <clears throat> the woman said to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou the living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. And the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our forefathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the men Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when she shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what, and we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he taught with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest with her? The woman then left her water pot and went on her way into the city and said to the man, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. <clears throat> In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Have you any man brought him to eat? Excuse me. And Jesus said unto him, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, therefore are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white, or ready to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here is the saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I have sent you to reap that wherein you bestow no labour, other than men laboured, and ye are entered into their labours. <coughs> Excuse me. The background to this passage is kind of like the background in Northern Ireland with the Catholics and Protestants. The Catholics and Protestants were against each other, and you have the army and the police trying to stop them fighting each other. And it's the same kind of antagonism, animosity, that was at the time of Jesus with the Samaritans and the Jews. The Jews did not go to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans did not go to the Jews. They were at each other's throat. 
But at this religious time, important festival, Jesus decides to go into the Samaritan area, which was quite a taboo or not what Jews would do. And so that is the kind of background to this passage. Now, I want to talk about a few points. <clears throat> Number one, the danger of dead orthodoxy. The danger of dead orthodoxy. If you look at chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. John chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. So, in this passage, the Lord is harassed by the Pharisees, and he feels compelled to go to Samaria so that he may talk to this Samaritan woman. And <clears throat> the Lord, if you turn to Jeremiah chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. So the Jewish people of that time, the Pharisees of that time, the Sadducees of that time, the leaders of that time, They'd gone for religion and not life. They'd gone for religiosity and works rather than the living fountain of the living God. If you turn to Isaiah 44 verse 3. Isaiah 44 verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. And the Lord has offered himself, offered the Holy Spirit to his people, but his people in the time of Jesus went for religion and, and missed the blessing that Jesus was offering. In John chapter 7, verse 38, John chapter 7, verse 38, we hear the Lord say, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. <clears throat> the Lord was offering new life in the Holy Spirit. But the Pharisees had missed it. The Pharisees were blinkered. They were more upon laws and regulations and religion. And they'd missed this blessing of the Lord who was saying, I've come to give you living water. In the time of Jesus... You had various groups. You had the Pharisees. who were like quite orthodox. They were very orthodox in their thinking. But they still missed the truth about Jesus. You had the Sadducees who were like liberal Protestants or rationalist Calvinists. You had the Herodians who used religion as a form of convenience. You had the zealots who were political, politically left of politics and kind of saw the answer politically to every problem was a political answer. You have the Essenes who spent their time in the mountains like a cult. You had the Pharisees who were very orthodox. And then you had the Samaritans who believed that you worshipped on a particular mountain, Mount uh, Gazim, Gazrim, I think it is. But what you had is dead orthodoxy. A lot of dead orthodoxy. A lot of people who were dead in their orthodoxy, who miss the living water of Jesus, the living life of Jesus. If you turn to Matthew uh, 23, Matthew 23. Verse 1 to 8. <clears throat> then spoke Jesus to the multitude and said to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you, observe that observe and do. 
But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men, they make broad the phylcateries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogue. And greetings in the market are to be called men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you brethren. This dead orthodoxy wanted the praise of men, wanted the honour of men. You turn to Matthew 12, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. We read these words. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given but the sign of the prophet Jonah. So they were saying, Show us a sign. They, they wanted to be impressed by Jesus, or they were not interested in Jesus. And you could read much in the New Testament about these Pharisees and scribes with their dead orthodoxy, where they were always questioning Jesus, always judging him. You can see that in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, <clears throat> verse 1 to 11. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman, taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convinced by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And when Jesus had lifted up himself, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So these Pharisees had come, and the, and the doctors of the Lord had come only to condemn this woman and judge Jesus. And Jesus says, who are you? You're, you're a sinner too. And, and they, they didn't like it and they walked off. But Jesus offered forgiveness and new life to the adulterous woman. Dead orthodoxy wants to judge. Dead orthodoxy wants to put people in a bag, in a box. Dead orthodoxy wants to be impressed by men. But Jesus and his message wants to bring new life to people. If you turn to uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Is your <clears throat> orthodoxy today alive? Where your orthodoxy wants to see people come to know Jesus and be alive in Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit? Or is yours a dead orthodoxy? Where you're always judging people. Where you want to impress, be impressed by men. You want to impress men. You want to be known to, to, to be an impressive person in your community. And that's all that matters to you. And, you. and you're constantly judging individuals in your church. Trying to make them more like you rather than more like Jesus. John chapter 14 verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide in you 
forever. Even the Spirit of truth in the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And so the Lord there talks from John chapter 14, 16 to 26. We only read a few verses about the Holy Spirit. Verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whosoever I have said unto you. Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again to Nicodemus. Here the Lord is saying, you will be sent the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. If you go to Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22. We read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness and faith. You see, Jesus our Lord came to touch people's lives, to save them individually by the power of the Holy Spirit coming into their lives, that the Holy Spirit would fill them and, and, and convict them and fill them, and that these people would be bearing fruit in the Holy Spirit, a life in the Spirit. Is your orthodoxy become dead, that it, you're not living in the Spirit, you're not living in the, life, the new life of the Holy Spirit, but your heart is dead. Your heart is judgmental. If you turn to 2 Corinthians 13, 14. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and what? The communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. The communion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the dangers of dead orthodoxy. You can be so consumed with your orthodoxy that you miss the life in Christ by the Holy Spirit. You miss the life of Christ in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, I just want to say um, <clears throat> the Bible talks about being sound in doctrine. In Titus chapter 1, the church to be planted there was to choose leaders of sound doctrine. In Galatians chapter 1, he says, Cursed is anyone who preaches not the gospel. In other words, you've got to be sound. On the, on the gospel. I am a great believer in sound doctrine. We have to have sound doctrine. I'm a believer in the importance of doctrine. The person who says doctrine is not important doesn't know their Bible. Read your Bible. Your Bible clearly teaches you doctrine is important. When the early church met in Acts chapter 2, at the end of Acts chapter 2, it clearly states they met for the apostles' teaching for fellowship, for breaking of bread, etc. But he clearly states they met for teaching, of the, the apostles' teaching. You cannot be an elder unless you're sound in the faith. That is a qualification to be a leader in the church. Jude says, earnestly contend for the faith. You need to be orthodox. You need to be sound in your theology. But you can be so sound in your theology... That you're not got the spirit within you. You're, you're, it's more head knowledge rather than heart knowledge. You can be so correct up here that it's not gone down here. So I'm all for the up here. I'm all for doctrine. I'm all for sound teaching. It's so vital to stand for sound doctrine. If a, if a, if a minister, a pastor was here right now. And I had a group of ten people, ten young people. And the pastor had a PhD in theology and lectured at Oxford University and, and, and was known as a professor of theology and, and was revered amongst God's people. But this pastor uh, said the Bible has got errors in it and, and he was teaching young people and I was there, I'd rebuke that minister and say, I'm sorry but your teaching is not sound, it's dangerous. There are no errors in, in the word of God. 
Whether you've got a, a professorship or whether you're the biggest minister in England, doesn't matter. You are teaching error and, and we're not having it. So sound theology, sound doctrine is so important. But there is a danger of dead orthodoxy. Your orthodoxy is not living, it's not life, and it's not bringing life to people. It, it, you're not bringing the spiritual life to people. People need to be coming into connection with the Lord Jesus Christ and being born again of the Holy Spirit and living in the life of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. And your dead, your dead orthodoxy is not producing people who are walking in the Spirit. And you're not walking in the Spirit. Your heart has become hardened. Your heart is too judgmental. Your heart doesn't have any love. It doesn't have any love for Jesus and doesn't have any love for the lost. doesn't have any love for your fellow brothers and sisters because you're so correct up here that you're neglecting the work of the Spirit in here. Beware of dead orthodoxy. Secondly, crossing the cultural divide. Crossing the cultural divide. If you turn to John chapter 4, verse 7. There was a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, hast drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said unto thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And you could read right up to verse 28. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus crossed three cultural divides. Number one, as a Jew you would not go into Samaria. He went into Samaria. Number two, you do not talk to a woman on your own. He talked to a Samaritan woman on his own. And number three, you don't offer salvation to the Samaritans. And he offered salvation to a Samaritan woman. He crossed the cultural divide. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37, if you turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37, Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37. Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 37. And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell down among thieves and stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked at him, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he, he had compassion on him. The one whose heart was right was the Samaritan. The others did not show love, even though they were orthodox in their head, they did not show love to the man who was needy. The Samaritan woman had a heart that was ready and receptive to receive the Lord Jesus. Sometimes the most unlikeliest people are candidates for grace. Sometimes the most unlikely of people are candidates for grace. 
The Samaritan woman had many, many men. She was, a she was a Samaritan and she was a woman, and yet the Lord went to her. She was, she was ready to receive the message, and she was a candidate for the grace of God. In Jonah, uh, chapter 1, Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, and he didn't want to go, and he disobeyed. In chapter 3, he got swallowed by a whale. In chapter 4, he was... He was complaining, why did he have to preach to the Ninevites? And why have they repented? And why did God show them mercy? And God was saying, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a merciful God, even to the Ninevites. There'll be no revival in the church or in the community until we cross the cultural divide. Until we go out of our comfort zone. The Lord went out of his comfort zone. He went into an area that his people, the Jews, would not go. He went to a woman who they, you don't speak to a woman on your own. He went to a Samaritan woman. Samaritans were despised by the Jews. He went to a woman who committed adultery, who'd been sleeping around. He went to someone who was the, at the very edge of society, a nobody of nobodies. She was on the very edge as a nobody. But he went to her and he showed her love. He showed her mercy. He showed her grace. He went out of his comfort zone. Went across the cultural divide. And he reached out to this woman in love. When the early Methodists started, John Wesley saw George Whitfield preaching in the fields uh, to miners and to people who didn't come to church and John Wesley didn't like it. It, 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 it didn't sit well with him, he was a very cultured minister. But he had, he, he, he had a love for people and he realised that he needed to do what Whitfield was doing and he, he went and preached out on the streets to people, to, to the ordinary people who didn't go to church. He crossed the cultural divide. It was radical in his day but God blessed him. The Salvation Army, when it started, when the early uh, Salvation Armies were banging the, the tambourines and singing in the, in the pubs of the day, it seemed crazy. But it, they crossed the cultural divide. They went to the drunks of the day and they ministered to them. There'll be no blessing until we cross the cultural divide. She used the mountains as an excuse. You, you Jews worship this way and you, uh, we worship on this mountain. And she tried to get away and hide from what Jesus was saying. But Jesus pointed to her sin and said, no, you're a sinner. And, and she responded by believing in him. You can cross the cultural divide. You can go to the people who are lost. But you don't compromise the truth. You don't compromise the message. There are people today that are trying to be relevant to people. But they become so relevant. They water down the gospel. And then they become irrelevant. Jesus didn't do that. He crossed the cultural divide, but he didn't water down the message. He said, you're a sinner and you need to repent. Who is the group that you find the most difficult to get on with? I've seen churches pray for drug addicts to come into their church. And I've taken drug addicts to the church and they've not ministered to the drug addicts I've seen churches pray reach the young people of the estate and ministries have started in the church to reach young people and then they've closed those ministries down because they don't like too many youth upsetting the church who is the most difficult group in your area in your life that you find difficult to minister to, you need to cross the cultural divide and go to them. 
with the gospel. And then finally, we've looked at the danger of dead orthodoxy, we've looked at crossing the cultural divide, and then thirdly, receiving a harvest. Uh, if you go to John chapter, 20, uh, John chapter 4, verse uh, 28. The woman then left her water pot and went away in the city and said unto them, Come, see a man which told me all things that I did, is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one another, Has any man brought him or to eat? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye therefore are set for months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for they are white already for harvest. One person the Samaritan woman went away and she brought the whole village back. We are surrounded today with political correctness in Islam and all the issues that face our nations. And it's tempting to get discouraged by what we see around us. But we need to remember that in the time of Jesus, one person was saved, a Samaritan woman, and that changed the whole game in that area, the whole situation in that area, because she affected the whole of her village. Just one person saved in a city, one person saved in a town, one person saved in a village can change the whole situation in that area. And you need to realize as you share the gospel, there will be a harvest. You can go to Mark, Mark chapter 4, verse 1 to 12, for, and verse 13 to 20, about the parable of the sower, and as the sower the seed, some seed falls on good soil and bears fruit. There will be a harvest in your ministry as you serve the Lord, wherever you are, you'll see a harvest. Believe it. Believe if you sow the seed, the seed will grow, and some will come to know the Lord. Pray. Water your seed with prayer and believe the seed will grow in people's hearts and you will see a harvest in your service for him. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8. He said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who shall go for us? Then said, I hear, am I, send me. Here am I, send me. The Lord gives us an example of a missionary heart. He goes into Samaria to speak to one woman. To share the gospel to her. He did not promote dead orthodoxy. But promoted new life. He wanted to bring the life of the spirit. He said we worship in spirit and in truth. And he spoke to this lady. And she came to know the Lord. And she affected a whole village. And that is an example of what he did. That we are to do. Pray. That God will send you to that one person who is willing to hear the gospel. Pray that God will send you. But are you willing to go? It might be some person in your work situation. It might be somebody in your estate. Somebody in your family. It might be even somebody in another nation. But are you willing are you going to say right now, Lord, I, I lay down my, my agenda. I lay down what I want for my life and I give it to you. Lord, I'm here. 
And if you want me, send me. And maybe God will call you to the mission field, to work as a missionary in foreign lands or in your community. But are you willing to go? Are you willing to lay down your agenda and let Christ have his way in your life? Maybe there's a community that nobody goes to. Maybe there's a group of people that really need to hear about Jesus. Maybe they're a group that are not respected or valued. And maybe God has put it on your heart to reach them. But you've been resisting. You've been saying, I don't want to do it. It's, it, it's too difficult. Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable. But maybe God is saying to you, here am I, send me. Maybe you're someone who is sound in theology. You're sound. But you're seeing little fruit in your life, little fruit in your ministry. Maybe God is saying to you, it's good that you sound in your theology. But it's about people. I want people to be saved. And I want them to come into this new life of the Holy Spirit. And you're blocking this in your own life and you're blocking it in your ministry and you're blocking it in reaching individual people. Maybe the Lord's saying to you, you need to focus on people. And you need to believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. That he's working in your life. And that he's, he can work in people's lives. And maybe you should be ministering to people the gospel. And believing in the power of the Holy Spirit to convert them. And to bring them on in spiritual things. Maybe you need to allow your orthodoxy to have life in the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of the Samaritan woman. We thank you, Lord, as we read about you, that you always bring life to individuals, that you offered a living water, and she heard that message, and she came to salvation in you, and the Holy Spirit touched her life. Holy Spirit, forgive us of our sin and fill us afresh today. Renew our orthodoxy. Renew it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Set our hearts ablaze for you, Lord, and set our hearts with love for the needy. Let us see people as you see them. Tear down the walls of our prejudice, the walls of our hostility, and the coldness of our hearts. And Lord, inflame us with a love for you, and a love, a love for the lost. We ask these things, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. I hope that was a blessing to you. And I hope that encourages you and strengthens you in your faith. And uh, please pray for me as I do mission in the UK. And also this possibility, I've just been to Holland and uh, been preaching in Belgium. And uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, sharing the gospel. And uh, I just ask that you would continue to pray for me and uh, Pray that God would guide me and show me the way forward and uh, bless my ministry so I value your prayers uh, and your support. So thank you. I hope this message was a blessing to you and uh, an encouragement to you. It was shared 
at a group in Holland. I've got back from England and I've, I've given you this message as well. I've got another message which I'm going to share now and I hope it's a blessing to you. So God bless you. Take care.